صباح الخير جميعا صباح الخير ومرحبا بكم في مكتبة اسكندرية Good morning ladies and gentlemen Welcome to this biannual edition of BioVision Alexandria where our theme is going to be the next decade and where many of us will look at different aspects that are necessary to support the scientific revolution in the years ahead. So you will find in your program much that is not fitting in the narrow definition of the new biological sciences, but science in general, preparation for it, capacity building, human resources, roles of universities, roles of research institutes, international cooperation, are all part of our program. Now I would like uh, to begin this session by inviting my colleague, my friend, my associate, the man really who has been most responsible for organizing BioVision with a group of very talented young people in the Library of Alexandria. I ask you to welcome the maestro of this whole enterprise, Dr. Mohammed Al-Faham. Good morning, everyone. Be sure that I will be giving no speeches, so you know, you can relax. You will see me here for housekeeping. You know the housekeeping, right? The first housekeeping is an exercise that we do in the library in every event, what we call the event BA exercise. Have you heard about it before? Anyone? No one? The BA exercise. It is to put your hand, right hand up, I'll do it first and then you'll do it together, right? Right hand up or left hand up or both together. It's up to you. Right? And then you fall down to your bucket or your bag uh, and get out this devil. The mobile. Right? And then you put it off or silent. Take the battery out break it, whatever it is. We don't want to hear it anymore, at least during the sessions. And then you put it back. Now the exercise is done? No, it's not done. There is a financial part attached to it, which is, if we hear your mobile, you will pay 10 units of your currency. It is $10. 10 pounds, 10 Egyptian, whatever it is, 10, whatever, 10 anything. We don't accept credit cards. This is for the first time. Now, if it rings again, you know what we'll do? What? Anyone? We'll give you back the mobile. I'm sorry. We'll give you back the 10 pounds or dollars or whatever it is, and take the mobile. Okay? We agree on this? Everyone? Okay. Let us do the exercise now. Your hands up. Two together. One. You're not raising your hand there. Please. There you go. Yeah. I can count your hands, right? Yeah. And then put it down to your bucket or bag or whatever. Take the mobile out, put it off, right? You can watch your photos if you want to, but push silence on side and put it back. That's it. This is my speech for today. Now, uh, I have the privilege, this is my first time to have the president, Dr. Smeister Agadir himself introduced me, which is a great privilege. Now, we start with our BioVision Alexandria Conference 2014. The opening session will start with a welcome note from Dr. Ismail Sraguddin, 
and I will introduce the others after him. Dr. Swagdi, <laughs> you sure? Okay. Uh, now we are, have the privilege of having uh, our Minister of State for Environment Affairs, Dr. Leila Iskander. Please take the board. Thank you, Dr. Faham, Dr. Ismail Saragiddin, Your Excellencies, all of you wonderful young people. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and to share with you some reflections in general, not specifically on biotechnology, on the environment, the mandate with which I was charged with the wonderful team of people in the Ministry of Environment and in the WWA, which is the Egyptian Environmental Affairs Agency. Uh, I come originally from civil society. Many, many years ago, I stormed into Dr. Ismail Saragiddin's office at the World Bank, and with a group of civil society people, we were talking about the rights of informal sector workers in recycling in a context of municipal contracts that went to large corporations and sometimes even to multinationals. At that time, uh, it was about human rights, economic rights, not specifically in the environment. <clears throat> Since I've come to be in this position and now have taken this job, it's becoming clearer and clearer to me that really the environment is about economic and social rights. Because at the end of the day, it boils down to how we, as a group of people inhabiting certain geographic boundaries, are going to share the resources this country has and how we're going to price them and how we're going to use them, what we're going to leave behind for the next generation, what we're going to destroy in this one, and who's going to benefit from it, and how we're going to manage the entire enterprise of our resources. So if I happen to know a little about garbage, I'll, I'll try to, through that example, explain to you what I mean. In many countries like Egypt, the most efficient and persistent group of people that work in the collection of garbage and in its recycling are the poor. Many mega cities like Cairo, <coughs> and Alexandria is becoming one too, uh, have toiled with this question of how to keep their cities clean, but have never gotten it quite right. Because whether it's Cairo or Lima or New Delhi or Manila or whatever, the people who persistently and regularly collect are those who have a vested interest in the materials they are going to recover. Hence, when a governor or a city councilman tries to design a formal system, he's always beaten by those who are outside of his formal design and who eventually do a much better job. But we, we're always keeping them out of the system. So how did it happen? How did this story come around? It came about because the rich, you, you're considered rich, you never had to fetch water, you never had to live with rats, you're rich. You people, wittingly or unwittingly, all of us, we entered into consumption patterns that have become wasteful. But that's not what our forefathers did. The ancient Egyptians were not wasteful. So we copied blindly, copycats, and we became wasteful consumers and began tossing things out. And when we toss things out, it's because originally we had a lot of the resources of our country. We had so much of them that we could afford to throw some of them out. And what we tossed out was what the poor of this city and others lived on. And they enterprised. This is the amazing thing that all of the mega cities of the South uh, demonstrate. The poor of mega cities have enterprise. We call them scavengers, we call them roamers, we call them garbage collectors, we call them um, catadores. They go by different names, but in the end, they are business people who have decided they want to invest in their country's resources, but their country only threw them the crumbs of the poor, only allowed them that much of the country's resources. 
Now, it may sound very dramatic, but in fact, that is what it is all about. And as they enterprised, they were always constantly kept at bay. And they were not given the chance to formalize, to have contracts, to live in decent housing, but they did build their own homes. They saved a very important ingredient in nation building for people to save money. They didn't, couldn't access banks and they established businesses. And they established in this country and others a huge value chain that led all the way up to corporate Egypt, the large manufacturers in the recycling industry who were waiting for the materials to arrive right at the door, their doorstep, sorted and processed by these people that we continually tried to evict out of the economy. We never counted them. We always treated them like lawless criminals, when in fact, they never held the government hostage to international contracts or arbitration. Uh, they didn't have proper zoning for their industries. Uh, and uh, they were actually the honest poor who rather than go into drugs and criminal gangs, chose to live on the crumbs that the rich tossed out of their kitchens. That cannot continue. Whether we're talking about biotechnology and how farmers can grow more food, we have to look at how we're going to, as a nation, as a people, divvy up the resources of this country. Are we going to keep on giving large investors only, large tracts of land, subsidized power, tax breaks, import uh, holidays, whatever? Or are we gonna start establishing a principle that all Egyptians, especially after two revolutions, have a right to the resources of their country and that the, the, the entitlement and the pricing of these resources have everything to do with the environment. The sand that we give away free almost to people who produce cement, the minerals we give almost free to whoever, the very tricky contracts we go into in our oil and gas sector. Uh, all of these have to be looked at. But in parallel, we also have to look at how we're pricing these resources. For sure, those of us who have four or five air conditioning units in their homes do not deserve a subsidy on their electricity. We have to revisit all of these um, policies so that we can go on the right track and make sure that everybody has a piece of this country and everybody uh, lives a decent lifestyle. From our land resources to our water resources to our air, we're now learning in the Ministry of Environment that we must change our laws. Currently, our environmental laws are extremely lax, non-enforceable. We have to build the capacity of our team and uh, we have to rally the support of the rest of the government because, for instance, if, you, if the Ministry of Environment decides that a certain factory has been polluting the Mediterranean or the Nile, there's a process where we establish the violation, um, clamp, down, clamp down a fine, give them a period to comply, and then we send to the governor a request to close the factory. So the ministry has no clout. Some of these laws have to change. The fines that are placed on violating industrial establishments are so low that they really, it's not worth their while to stop uh, polluting and that's what one of the reasons our Nile has gotten to where it is right now. Uh, lots and lots of issues, not insurmountable for sure, not when you have an auditorium filled with so many wonderful, beautiful young people like you people are, who have a desire and a dream for a better future. My only hope is that it's not a future where there's a vision in your mind of consumption. If we all walk out of here desiring in our hearts a villa and a four-wheel drive and lots of designer clothes and three mobiles and this and that, then we're on the wrong track. We have to think of where we're all heading as future generations. In environmental lingo, it's called sustainable development, but I know you all understand what it means. And I'm just hoping that at the end of your youth, you can look back and say, well, it's okay. 
I didn't get that villa or that four-wheel drive or that car, but I did something good with my life and with the resources of my country, and I definitely shared with others. Thank you. Our next speaker is the uh, president of a university, which is a big university, as we know. In the States or Europe, you have like 10,000, uh, 20,000 students, which is the average number there. But if you haven't heard about the 20, 100,000 or more, this is, I think, the undergraduate only doctor, Sama, please join me to welcome the President of Alexandria University, Dr. Usama Brahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, distinguished guests, my colleagues, my uh, actually, uh, I see here uh, brothers and I see sons and daughters. I welcome you all and I share with Dr. Ismail the honor of welcoming you in the Bibliotheque Alexandria. Uh, you know the Bibliotheque and the University are strategic partners, and hopefully in the next decade we will see more and more cooperation between the two institutions. I'm here wearing different hats. The hat of a university president that formally welcomes you, and the hat of a, an eye doctor who spent three decades of his life trying to correct vision. And uh, as a physician, I look forward for the next decade where the sciences are no longer uh, distinct from each other as we used to be. We used to have each one has his own island where he works independently, doing an excellent job, not even noticing his neighbor or uh, what's, what's going on in the outside world. Now that the whole world is, became like a small village, and the whole sciences actually became integrated. We are really looking for life sciences, life sciences that the, don't distinguish between a, an MD or a PhD or a doctor or a dentist. We are all living in this planet. We are all working together. As an eye doctor, I am affected by the environment. If I'm living in a, in a bad environment, it will affect my health and the, it will affect my, uh, my job as well. So hopefully, and I do pledge you for this uh, interesting conference, to come up with uh, a plan for the next decade that will help us reformulate our life in a way that really we change, as Her Excellency the Minister mentioned. We, we, we need to think of our sons and daughters and granddaughters who will inhabit this land after we leave. So please think wisely, work together, learn how to integrate your knowledge and to share the knowledge rather than to keep it for yourself. And I'm waiting for the, uh, whatever will come of this interesting conference. I'm glad to be here and I'm honored. And I uh, thank you all for coming and I'm really proud to see all this crowd. Thank you all for, thanks a lot. Our next speaker is someone who does think about science and technology, but not in a closed loop. He thinks about science and technology as related to the society. Uh, we have with us the founder and the chairman of the Science and Technology in Society, STS Forum from Japan. Please join me to welcome Mr. Kuji Umi. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. And I'm really happy to be able to attend 
the biovision meeting under the strong leadership of Dr. Seragerdin. Please allow me in to start by explaining the fundamental concept of science and technology in society forum, of which I'm founder and chairman. The rapid progress of science and technology has brought economic growth and enriched our quality of life on the one hand. But on the other side, science and technology has brought about new environmental, ethical, and security problems. We call these the rights and the shadows of science and technology. We must strengthen the right and control the shadows of science and technology. For that purpose, I felt it necessary not only for professional scientists, but also policymakers, business executives, and media and other leaders to gather and discuss science and technology issues from the long future viewpoint of humankind, the humankind development and prosperity for the future of humanity. Science and technology issues affect all of us today. We must think of them of something that concerns us personally, not leaving them on the science and technology professionals. The problem also cannot be solved by one or two countries alone, and therefore it is important for people from all over the world to gather and discuss the issue. I want to begin together, I wanted to bring together leaders from many different fields to contribute their perspectives in the issue of science and technology in society today. This is why I created the SCS Forum as a gathering for influential individuals in the field in such an in fields such as the science and technology engineering, business, policy making and media to discuss the rights and shadows of science and technology. In connection with the themes health, education, environment, and food and agriculture on the program at BioVision, discussions at the SS Forum have centered on future sustainability of the world, where the crucial elements are environment, energy, food, and water. One topic discussion every year at the SS Forum is human health, where Japan hopes to make more important contribution, particularly in the field of biotechnology and drug development. In, in sectors such as automobile and electronics, Japan is a powerful powerhouse, but Regretfully, the same cannot be said of the pharmaceutical industry. Why is this? Japan exceeds in basic research, but clinical research is a difficult issue. Because of the regulatory environment, drug development and approval for clinical research take time. The result, result is that Japanese drug industries are less competitiveness, competitive in global market. It is clear that there is a need to strengthen bio and clinical research to make the Japanese drug industry globally competitive and con contribute to human health worldwide. We are now planning to establish a medical innovation center for global clinical research in Okinawa. The aim is to make 
this center and Okinawa a hub for clinical research and development in Asia. The cooperative relationship will be established with the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, of which I am the founding founder, and other leading Japanese and U.S. agencies and research institutions to strengthen, to support the further development of the clinical research. Along with regulatory reform, the center will help strengthen the Japanese drug industries so that it can develop innovation and effective solutions for human health. The SCS Forum and BioVision share common objects as far as global health, sustainability, and importance of innovation are concerned. I hope that the participants will benefit from the fruitful discussion over the next few days. Thank you. We heard voices from Egypt and a voice from Japan. Now it is the time to hear a voice from Europe. We are privileged to have with us today here the head of the delegation of the Egyptian Union in Egypt. Please join me to welcome Mr. James Moran. Mr. Leila Iskander, Ambassador Sarah Godin, Mr. Kojiomi, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's always a pleasure to be in Alexandria. Uh, uh, even more so today because coming up from Cairo, you get a double dose of fresh air. Fresh air of your beautiful climate, uh, with the wind blowing so clear and so pure from the sea, and the fresh air of seeing so many bright young faces before you. Uh, and I congratulate all of you. It's great to see this turnout uh, for this conference today. And what could be more important uh, than its subject? Uh, of course, biosciences and the future. So we're very happy to be here. We have a long-standing partnership with the Bibliotheca. Uh, in fact, it's a strategic partnership um, uh, through cooperation in culture, science, innovation activities, uh, we also work uh, with educational institutions here. The president of the university uh, knows that. We have many projects at Alexandria University. Uh, and uh, here at the BA, just a few months ago, we signed a new agreement uh, uh, between us uh, for the implementation of a program for cultural diversity and creativity, uh, which is uh, getting underway now. Um, so many people around the world are suffering from poverty, uh, lack of access to basic needs, environmental degradation, as the minister so passionately reminded us. Uh, but humanity possesses the knowledge to alleviate the suffering of these people. Uh, and we believe that international cooperation in science and innovation, one of the strategic objectives of the European Union, is absolutely essential in the quest for better science, better application of knowledge, and above all, and allied to political will, better socio-economic conditions for people everywhere. And to bring this a little closer to home here in Egypt, while many advances have been made, in recent years it's important uh, to remember that poverty remains a major challenge. Indeed, here, in the last three years since the revolution, we've seen poverty rise from 21 to 26 percent of the population. These are Egyptian government statistics, uh, and they are well thought out and they are well verified. So it remains a major problem. And with uh, that in mind, 
Uh, we're stepping up our engagement uh, with our international partners um, across the board and uh, in particular in science and innovation. I'll say more about that in a moment. In doing it, we need to make sure that we cooperate in areas where we can add most value, where there's a clear common interest and a mutual benefit, and where the impact uh, is the greatest. Uh, in that regard, the European Commission adopted a, a new strategy for international cooperation in research and innovation uh, just over a year ago. It has three key aims. First, strengthening excellence uh, in research and innovation through facilitating access to knowledge, people, and markets across borders and around the globe. Secondly, tackling global challenges. Uh, we need to cooperate, of course, internationally to address um, matters such as food security, energy efficiency, climate change, the list is long. And thirdly, supporting external policies. Many of the international agreements that uh, we as Europe have signed, um, such as uh, our commitments to assist uh, developing countries, including here in Egypt, um, need to be underpinned by efforts uh, in research and innovation. How do we do it? Well, for many years we've had something called the Framework Program for Research and Technological Development, created some 20 years ago, and has just finished its seventh phase in 2013. And uh, just uh, a couple of months ago, um, we launched the European Union's new effort, uh, which supersedes the Framework Program, uh, which is called Horizon 2020, or as it's known, H2020. It is the largest and most open research program in the world, with close to 80 billion euro of funding over the next seven years, and that in an area of austerity in Europe. Um, Horizon 2020 is one of the very few areas of the European Union's budget to see a major increase in resources. In fact, it's up by 30% over what was spent in the previous uh, seven years. Um, it's proof positive of the enormous importance we give to science and innovation as engines of economic prosperity. H2020 will be the main instrument for implementing uh, international cooperation strategy, and it will provide a coherent set of uh, funding, tools, and practical support across the entire innovation chain, from basic research to close to market actions. Many, many of them in uh, the area that this conference is uh, concentrating on. Um, research, under the seventh framework program, we, when we're building on this, uh, we've had a number of uh, activities. Researchers from 80 different countries have participated in the very successful Mary Sklodowska Curie actions. 20% uh, uh, of the projects, uh, that's over 3,000 projects funded under the seventh uh, framework program, included at least one international partner in the consortium. And here in the southern Mediterranean, we've had over 300 projects, including over 100 right here in Egypt, many of them in this area, uh, a few of them at uh, Alexandria University and other educational institutions here, uh, which were funded under FP7. And a couple of good examples uh, I just want to give. Uh, one of the largest programs anywhere in the world that we're doing is the MATS Solar Energy Demonstration Program, which is here. Uh, right here in Alexandria, um, and uh, 20 million euros of funding going into that in an area, enormously exciting area for the future for this country, uh, and indeed uh, eventually perhaps for Europe itself. Uh, and I would also like to just cite uh, two major health programs which have been funded under FP7, which are fighting hepatitis C, where, of course, as you will all know, uh, this country has the highest incidence uh, in the world and uh, that health uh, issue remains a, a, a massive problem. Um, uh, here in this country, we also have our Research Development Innovation Program, uh, which is supporting Egypt's effort to develop a knowledge-based economy. In addition to all of this, we also have the new Erasmus Plus Program, uh, which is uh, integrating the previous ones called Tempus and Erasmus Mundus. Again, uh, many people in the room uh, maybe will know of it, will have participated in these programs. Uh, the new effort uh, simplifies and increases the budget of uh, the program, and we should be able to offer more financial support for mobility of students and researchers and cooperation amongst higher education institutions, both within Europe and uh, around the world, and above all in our, what we call our neighborhood, uh, right here in the southern Mediterranean and in Egypt. 
We share many, many challenges in higher education, uh, and there's no doubt we can learn a lot from each other as we adapt our systems to meet the needs of the modern world. Um, I hope that there will be good participation in all of this, and I'm saying all this, of course, by way of marketing, because um, right outside uh, here we uh, have a uh, stall where you can learn more about uh, how to participate in these various programs and what they're all about, and I hope you will take advantage of that. Um, and uh, let me add, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, that the fast-growing needs of this population and others um, mean that the task before us is urgent. Um, Erasmus is named after the great Dutch scholar Desiderius uh, Erasmus, who lived about 500 years ago. He said, you must acquire the best knowledge first and without delay. He means excellence. It's the height of madness to learn what you will later have to unlearn. The sooner we can get down to this uh, cooperation, uh, the better for everyone. Um, and I hope uh, that people will take advantage of that. Uh, the turnout is extraordinarily impressive. Once again, uh, thanks for your attention, and do have a good day ahead. Shukran Gazilan. Now we have done with the, uh, the heavy meal speeches, and now we have the opening session dessert. It's the uh, keynote address by someone who doesn't need my introduction, actually, Dr. Ismail Saragiddi. everyone. We now come really to the uh, start of the content of uh, our address uh, for this conference. And today I will surprise many of my friends by not speaking that much about biology, although many of the people here and I have had many, many years together, almost 20 years working in biotechnology issues because I really want to go back to the fundamentals of science and the real challenges we have. So I'll run you through prologue, the challenge, who's leading the global revolution, the real knowledge revolution, and for many of our young people here, I will give an inspiring example developed by young people at the Library of Alexandria as part of an international collaboration to introduce automatic translation but which does a lot more for the Arabic language. So in the last part, although I will be speaking in English for our guests, there was a lot of material in Arabic, which we will all recognize. So we'll start with the prologue very quickly. First, welcome to BioVision. And to remember that the iconic image of the double helix applies now to health and medicine food and agriculture, and we will be having a celebration of the centenary of the great Norman Borlaug, uh, the man who led the, the Green Revolution, and uh, a good friend and a colleague who passed away a little while ago, and of course, environment. These were the three main threads of BioVision over the years, and they continue to be that way. But the new reality is that the new biology is really merging into three sciences, three scientific streams are merging together, the Bio-Info Nanotechnology, which has, comes out with a nice acronym, BINT, Arabic girl, but fundamentally, really, it is an enormous transformative scientific revolution. And it highlights the fact that, uh, yes, the old silos of the past are no longer valid, and the transformation is on the way. Behind everything that we deal with in health, in environment, in, in, uh, in uh, food and agriculture is science. 
science in the broad sense of the word, fundamental and applied, and every kind of science. So let us talk of the great scientific revolution underway and where we in Egypt and the Arab world are. Science. It is a very modern enterprise in the way it is being practiced today. Now ancient science existed in ancient Egypt and it existed also in the ancient library of Alexandria where there was an explosion of science from Euclid and others. But what we have in modern science, when the torch passed to Europe in the 16th century, things have changed. Actually, you'd be surprised to know that the word scientist did not exist in the English language until 1840, when uh, the polymath Weevil said, I am inclined to find a name for those who cultivate science and I would propose we call them scientists. So only 1840. The word R&D, research and development, did not exist until 1923. So it is really quite a recent enterprise, less than 100 years old, where we have seen this merger of science and transformation of science into technology. Uh, I mean, after all, Michael Faraday did not have uh, spin-off to generate electricity uh, uh, and make money out of it, and uh, many of the others did not either. Now, the challenge for us is that there is an increasing divide in the world between those who do science, those who know, those who capture the science and move on, and those who are left behind. And this is a very serious issue which we need to address, and uh, I agree very much that it is an urgent issue that we have to deal with. What's making this both possible and challenging is the informatics and communication revolution. We are now linked across the planet at the speed of light. We can learn, we can blog, we can communicate, and many of you do that. But there is not enough among you cooperating in science across borders, even though you communicate and blog across borders. Well, let's do science across borders as well. And that's important. And it's important because for some countries, collaboration alone can build capacity. In our own scientific capacity, as it increases, for the very lagging and very poor countries, it is almost impossible to advance science just by cooperation and cooperative programs, but for many others it is possible, and I would suggest that Egypt is at and crossing that divide. So we must focus on building up our own science and technology capacities. Now, I had the privilege of being called upon by the scientific academies of the world, all 95 of them who are members of the IAP and the IAC, and uh, I was tasked with Professor Jacob Pallis of Brazil of leading a team to write a report on what needs to be done to build worldwide capacity in science and technology. And uh, there's myself and Dr. Pallis. And in the name of the scientific academies who adopted the report in Mexico City in uh, uh, 2004, we presented it to the UN as the scientists view of what we need. And this is the seminar that was held there under his leadership. Simply stated, we have five clusters of recommendations. The first dealing with policy, and we'll take them one at a time, science, human resources, institutions, the public private domain, and finance. It is not true that money is the obstacle to do good science. You first have to get these four others right, and then science, and then the finance comes in for science. So let's take them one at a time. For science and society, we need a policy for science, but we also need to use science in an evidentiary-based way to formulate our own policies in our own country. Now, this is a marvelous uh, example. It so happens that this is September 11, 2001, which we all know for the collapse of the towers. This is the front page of the Washington Post. And what you have 
two stories on the front page about scientific reports. The, what, what do the academies say? A uh, key science group differs with Bush on stem cell research and the title rules for arsenic that the academies are doing. When did any of you open Al-Ahram or the Akbar or the, any of the newspapers and find on the front page discussions of scientific reports by academies? So when I say that we need science for policy and policy for science, it is not just that the president or the prime minister will declare science is important, we are going to back scientific research. No, it is integrated into the fiber of society. <coughs> and the scientific community has to do its bit by being involved with the media, the private sector, civil society, and the public sector. For the future belongs to science and those who make friends with science in the real sense of the word, said Nehru, and it's a great word. Now to do science, of course, we're talking about human resources and we need to improve science and technology education at all levels. From the youngest groups, and regretfully the world is very, very widely separated for in parts of sub-Saharan Africa that Lawrence Ombuga and I know well, we go to rural schools and we find not even a desk to sit on or a blackboard to look at. Children have computers and they're encouraged to explore and let their minds roam. And in other places, they are told to study by heart. Talqeen. Samma. Repeat. That is not the way to promote science. We need to ask and encourage children to ask what if, what if, what if, for science is a journey of discovery. So we need to emphasize science and math as a foundation for what will happen in higher uh, education from earliest levels and to learn to learn. And that I think is a fundamental part of getting our systems of education functional. It has to be done at all levels from kindergarten through postdoc. And yes, we have to deal with certain issues of how to attract and retain young talent in science and technology and how to transform old problems, turn brain drain into brain gain. And we have a special outreach for women in science. And how do we do brain drain to brain gain? Look at this graph here. This is a graph that shows the foreign born doctorates in the United States on this side. And on this side, co-authored papers with the United States and somewhere else. And people will say, well, it's very clear, the more you have, the higher uh, is the proportion of collaboration. E yes and no. Look at this, for the same number of the proportion of foreign doctorates, some countries are getting three to four times as much collaboration. Our policies right here count. They make a huge difference between the two. And there's a critical role for the universities, both in the formation of human talent as well as in the establishment of these collaborations. And in science, authority rests in the rational empirical method, not an individual or a theory or a belief. In fact, for the practice of science, we need the values of science, which themselves are worthy of being defended. Truth. No scientist anywhere will be tolerated if they fabricate data. Honor. No scientist anywhere will be allowed to plagiarize the work of others and put their name on it. These are values that other professions do not practice as well. Creativity and the imagination, a certain constructive subversiveness for as we advance, the old paradigm is removed and the new paradigm is replaced. But our respect for Newton is not diminished because Einstein gave us a new paradigm for space and time and matter and energy. We respect them both. And because Einstein was only 26 and Jim Watson in discovering the double helix was only 25 and Dirac was only 24 when he did the quantity, uh, uh, some of his uh, uh, quantum mechanics and uh, all of these people, you have to tolerate engagement with uh, the youngest 
of your students because you don't know where the next Einstein will come from. And we arbitrate dispute through evidence. Now, these are very valuable lessons that are learned at the university by student practice and teacher example. And science can inspire and move the imagination, and the international scientific community is truly a cultural force. And these values are forged in university and have to be taken into society. Institutions, we need to have centers of excellence, virtual centers of excellence. We require networking, which is becoming more and more possible, regional consortia, competitive grants based on merit, and promoting the values of science. So this can be done, but the best capacity building is really by working together on solving common problems. The public-private domain is something which we do not understand very well in our part of the world, but more than two-thirds of global, more than two-thirds of global research is not funded by governments generous as the EU may be. It is funded by private sector. So we need to deal with that and identify where the limited efforts of gov government should go in order to have the maximum impact in collaboration with the private sector. And this will require imaginative solutions to intellectual copyright issues, copyright issues, etc. And we must create development nodes. In Japan, they have beautiful development nodes which involve intellectual clusters, industrial clusters, regional revitalization. There's a beautiful example, the African efforts with European support, but uh, uh, this is in Kyoto University in Japan and technological incubators where venture capital can come in and help young people to open all sorts of new doors. And then and only then do we need money. If you don't have these other four areas, money will not be productive. So yes, it's important, but we need to go from funding research to funding companies. In the US, they have venture capitalists, and uh, they put pennies in order to reap millions later on. Think of those who invested early in many of these cases. Uh, here's an example which I love to give. Uh, a bunch of kids who come in with a wild idea, and the question is, would you have invested? This is Microsoft Corporation in 1978, and there is Bill Gates, which we all know now. The question is, if the equivalent of this group from among you came to a financier and the banker and said, we have a wild idea, something called Windows. It's going to change the world. Will they give you the money to set up a Microsoft Corporation? Will they have confidence in youth? That's what we need to do. So let me move on beyond that because I think all the parts are essential. They reinforce each other and the whole is more than the sum of the parts. There's one more thing. In our part of the world, and in all of Africa in particular, the Arab world and Africa, we have to translate rhetoric into action. Public declarations, plans, are not e equal to action. My friend Zapiro of South Africa, the great cartoonists uh, of South Africa, had a very nice cartoon about the African Union. And he says, you know, translators English into Arabic, Arabic into French, and English into Swahili, and rhetoric into action we're still missing a key translator. <laughs> and I think that's not just true of Africa. So, uh, uh, I mean, I think we could have put Arab League here as well as uh, African Union <laughs> would be equally true cartoon. My friends, this is the summary of what I am trying to tell you today, that we must become the producers of knowledge, not the consumers of technology. And that's going to be difficult to do, but we must focus on building up our science and technology capacities, and others have done it. Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, China, all have done it. And in our region, I have to show you the examples of Turkey and Iran. So look at this, contribution of Middle East countries to world science. The brown here that is more or less stable throughout is Israel. This goes from 1980 to 2010. The rising green here is Turkey. The rising blue is Iran. This purple is Egypt. The next 
the brown is Saudi Arabia, and that's the rest of the country. So all the Arab countries are here, and this is uh, uh, Iran and Turkey and Israel. We have barely grown in those 30 years in terms of our impact globally. That is the contribution in terms of traditional count of published papers. If you look at the contributions of Iran, Kuwait, and Iraq, they were more or less close to each other, and uh, Kuwait has gone up, and so uh, uh, has uh, Iran, and Iraq has, of course, dipped even before the war, but, but after the war is coming up again, but Iran is up here. Now, mind you, this is a logarithmic scale. That's 10, that's 100, that's 1,000, that is 10,000. That is 100,000. So this is closer to 12,000 contributions in terms of papers compared to what used to be about 200 to 12,000. In this case, you're looking at the specifically the nuclear papers compared to the rest of the world, the growth rate of Iran compared to the rest of the world. These are the specialties and so on. This, I'm very sad to say, is one of the saddest graphs I have to show you. The contribution to world science by region expressed as a percentage. Percentage. Okay. Asia, Northern Europe, North America, and uh, this is Europe. And then you have Latin America and Caribbean, and Australia is that blue up there. And the top, top line which is barely visible 1% or so, 2%, that is Africa and the Arab world. We are barely visible on the graph. You can see it, it's here. It's just a shadow of the, on that line. Again, these are the contributions, and this is where we lie, the bottom one here. So whether it's done on top or on bottom, it doesn't change. <laughs> no matter which way you look at it, we are not contributing to the production of knowledge. We are consuming technology, despite the fact that we invest a lot. Oh, really? Do we? I'll show you. Let's look here at other countries. Starting in 1980, this is China, and this is the United States. Now you can see where China is not just growing economically, it is growing in scientific output. This is the contribution to science of whole paper contributions in the recognized published journals. Okay, who is the leading authority in the world of science today? It's interesting, you can look at research papers, patents issued, expenditure, and higher education. Right now the United States is still number one. The EU is not grouped together, so we have Germany here, comes down here. Patents, South Korea and Japan come in ahead of Germany. Germany comes in second ahead of them in research papers. Higher education, US, Germany, UK, Japan, etc. Now, look, 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 look. No Arab country anywhere. No African country anywhere. This is Russia here, Russian Federation, Hong Kong, Brazil, Finland, etc. Okay, how about this? This is an interesting graph, and it has an Arab country in it. But this is the number of scientists per, and engineers per million people in this direction here. In this direction is expenditure on R&D as a percent of GDP. Israel is down here, very high in expenditure, not very high in terms of scientists and engineers per million population. Finland is highest on both sides. But look where Singapore is, little Singapore. Above the United States, above Denmark, above Switzerland, Germany, France, Japan, South Korea, Singapore is way up there. Less on expenditure, but very high on, on human resources. Now, what is the size of the circle 
is the size of the total amount of investment. This is as a percent of GDP here, and that is the percent of scientists and engineers per population. The only Arab country that barely shows up is Saudi Arabia over here for this, with this magnitude. And it is, along with Indonesia, is very close to the zero, zero line. Okay. How do you do science? Well, it turns out that there's enormous collaboration is very important. The United States tends to collaborate with itself a lot more than others. This United States here, China, Japan, etc. These are internal collaborations and these are external collaborations. So the United States, because it's so big, scientists from Massachusetts collaborate with California, etc., etc. And again, the EU would look different if you were to combine all of these together. This is Canada here, UK, Spain, Italy, and so on. And this is more in terms of cross-border collaboration, but you can see still the United States is very high domestically. But in the United States, you will see also something else, which is what is happening to other kinds of funding. I mentioned the private sector. Here is the growth of private sector funding in the United States compared to U.S. federal funding. So the private sector is becoming more and more of a very important partner in development research and specifically scientific research. And there are ways in which it is done, and academic involvement becomes very, very important in the central part of scientific integration and relevance and becomes less important when you come. That's the light gray is academic involvement as you get to dissemination and the like. Okay, so we need more education, better education. Well, let's look at this. This is a study by the World Bank that shows that more education is useless in the sense, in the sense that additional years of education has hardly any impact on the impact on growth, on economic growth. On the other hand, if you look at quality of education, ah, yes, if you improve the quality of education, but whether somebody has 12 years of education, 14 years of education, or 16 years of education, if the quality of education is bad, it doesn't make that much difference. The quality of education is good, yes, it makes a huge difference. And that's important for us to remember as we talk about content. And as I am very sad every year to hear people talk about how difficult the questions were in Sanawi al amma and how we have to uh, uh, give more grades to the students and so on, because the poor students couldn't answer the questions, so we lower the grades. Rather than try to raise the abilities of the students, we lower the grades and so on to make it easier. No, we want to improve quality. Now, next to that, there is a huge revolution going on. You all know about that, the ICT revolution. The Internet has really been the most transformative innovation. I am sad to point out, I wrote an article in 2009, on the 29th of October, for the 40th anniversary of the Internet. Nobody noticed it. It appeared in Al-Ahram, but nobody noticed it. This actually is the original paper which established the first time a computer spoke to another computer through what would become the Internet. And uh, these are the founders of that, Vin Cerf and Bob Kane, who did the TCP IP, one of the very few engineering systems that has been able to be increased a million fold and still be robust enough to work, which is the Internet. And the other one is mobile phones. And actually, the two are merging right now. As we all know, you are using the Internet on your mobile phone. Tim Berners-Lee is the third co-inventor of that. He invented the WWW, the World Wide Web, and uh, the HTML. So the Internet has really has become anything and everything. It crosses political boundaries. It enables us to communicate with each other at the speed of light. And it has an enormous amount of information but of very variable quality, a lot of which is garbage, not of the kind Her Excellency the Minister was talking about, but of intellectual garbage. And so we need to think differently. Regretfully, this is the old-style information. 
This is new style information storage. When will our governments go from this to that? The digital future is unstoppable. The only question is, are we going to integrate it with ourselves or not? It is from there that creativity will rise because we put at the fingertips of people the entire knowledge of the world is now available. So the new technology is creating new ways of doing things and some examples right here. We collaborate with at the Library of Alexandria. We're creating the Encyclopedia of Life. This is one of our biological projects, they involve biology. The idea is that today we can create an encyclopedia where every single organism, from microbes to elephants and whales, will have its own website. And behind it, we have a huge amount of information. And we are not only designing that and working with it, but we also are translating it into Arabic. Now, Suat al And you can enter eol.org. It's a collaboration between the library, the Smithsonian, and the National Academy of Sciences. And we have about 1.9 million basic species pages to reach. We have reached 1.3 million. And uh, we have 40,000 images from Flickr. 70 million pages from the BHL have been digitized. And I'll sh show you about that in a moment. So there's a web page for every species on the planet. So that's what it looks like. That's when you enter and you can do finds and search and so on here. And then each creature has its own homepage, such as that. And these are all different web pages. And then there's a comprehensive description, additional materials, you look morphology, diagnostic descriptions, uh, tropic strategies, habitats, etc., etc. We aim to produce it in Arabic, but we need to have inputs from Arab scientists as well. Now, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which comes at the back of it, has 600 million pages of material, of which now 70 million pages have been digitized, and that's what it looks like. All of this is available for free. And you enter the website of the library, eol.org will get you anywhere there. We also offer you a science course for free. Actually, more than 170,000 PowerPoint lectures like the one I'm giving right now are available for free. You can search in individual slides. You can form your own, collect the slides you want and use them in your own presentation. You can take an entire lecture and deliver it as you will. And it started in 2006 and it was initiated with 3,700 lectures in epidemiology and preventative medicine. And that was when we started with the super course, Epidemiology and, and Internet and Global Health. And then we moved on in here. In our 2008 BioVision, we presented that and we got everybody to participate. And this picture is taken right where you are sitting now in 2008. And we moved on and the four guiding scientists were uh, Vince Cerf, myself, Gil Oman, and Ron Laporte. And this is now the website. You can go on the science super course in the Library of Alexandria. You can choose, as I said, you can also rate the lectures that you like and you don't like, like you do in Amazon. There are things called legacy lectures, brilliant lectures, and so on. How many lectures do we have? Well, it's interesting here. In public health, 44,000 lectures. Computer engineering, 51,000. Agriculture, 78,000. And environment, 26,000 at present. And we are doing much more than that, and there will be a special session where we will discuss with you because we are offering, along with that free set of lectures, how to do research on quantitative methods. Because the reason very few papers get published and the fact that many of the studies bring little results is because they are poorly designed and statistically inadequately analyzed. So the findings cannot be robust enough to withstand replication. And we have found this in much of our work, but this is where you can go and get it. So we will be talking about that. There's a session on the program that deals with the super course and the help desk. But let me tell you next thing is about the real knowledge revolution. The real knowledge revolution is deep and profound. 
It is not just about the internet, although that is important. We are now in Web 2.0. We used to be everyone Web 2.1. Somebody posted something, somebody else read it. Now everybody is posting and reading, so everybody's become a consumer and a producer. But we're working on the semantic web, which will enable us to bring concepts and relationships and so on, and not look for objects. Now you go to Google, you find objects. We don't do that. We are at Web 2.0, and along with, with the work that is being done towards the semantic web, there's the social media. And Facebook, of course, everybody knows. So Nova Spivak did this diagram a few years ago and saying if we are moving more to information connectivity from the basic web which connected information, and here we are moving to more social connectivity, so okay, here the web, the old web connects information, the semantic web will connect knowledge because it's concepts and relationships, the social software will connect people, but what will we have up here, the meta web, will it be Connecting intelligence? Who knows? But it's certainly an interesting question. The other thread that comes in is big data. The revolution, I should really change that slide. I should say the revolution is here. It's not is coming, it is here. CERN in the Large Hadron Collider produces hundreds of petabytes of information for experiments. So to draw this image, this computer simulated image, of the path of particles that live a billionth of a billionth of a second requires an enormous amount of information. Just how much information that is captured in these computers, what the 100 petabytes, that means that if you were to take an HD high definition DVD and play it, two hours, play it continuously for uh, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week continuously, that amount of information would be the equivalent of seven hundred years of uh, high definition DVDs. And that's still quite small. The kilometer square array in radio astronomy, which is being designed in South Africa and Australia and is just coming online right now, one kilometer square of these radio astronomy things, will produce more information every day than the entire world produces today to put on the internet. Did this sink in? The entire world from United States to Australia, from Finland to uh, uh, Antarctica is putting material on the internet. One scientific experiment in Australia and South Africa today will be producing as much information as that entire global community. In fact, IBM, as you see the slide comes from IBM, dealing with the astronomical data deluge, as they rightly say. Now, the amount of thinking that has to go into how to filter and organize all this information, how to handle it, and not only how to handle it on computers, but how to get and extract useful information out of it. That is the revolution that's going on. How will we handle these huge amounts of information? It's already being done. Sometimes it's referred to as the cloud, but actually it's vast arrays of computers that are in distant locations. And Google, Yahoo, and others, and Amazon have been also major users of this. When I purchase something from uh, uh, Amazon, what they tell me, for example, is not only that I can buy with one click, but customers who bought this item also bought these other things. So they keep track of every click that I do sometimes so customers who have viewed this, have, you may be interested in looking at. That means every click you do when you go to a site like Amazon is organized, used effectively. When I click on what I want, if they said we have seven copies of that book, you come in a second after me, they will say six copies of the book is left. And immediately the warehouse will know that it has to send a, a book to that address. The shipping department will handle that part. The billing department will go and bill the department. And all of that is done in a fraction of a second. Now compare this capacity for the management of information with if any of you have gone to register something for Shahr al-Aqari. 
That is what I'm telling you. So when you look at the graph that you saw, and you, we are not even on the graph, we're not even appearing anywhere on the graph, it is because it's true, it's a major problem. Now, Amazon has not only been doing that, but all the others are doing this. And uh, it's moving very fast, and vast computer arrays are there. And I say that if you had asked me two years ago, uh, the United States listening in on all the phone calls of everybody, I would have said, no, 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 come on, billions of phone calls, that's far too much. We now know that the NSA has been doing that, and that they could target specifically the mobile phone of Angela Merkel and of uh, uh, President Dilma Rousseff of, uh, of Brazil, at least those two we know about, but there may be others, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, this is the operations uh, center of the NSA. And although the U.S. government has now said we're not going to do this anymore, this is actually the actual NSA because very few people know what it looks like. This is the National Science, uh, uh, National Security Agency. And they said that we're not going to do it anymore and so on, and put conditions on it. However, please, they just broke ground to double the size of the NSA which is understandable considering how science is going. But it's not just them. All the private companies are also involved with that. And it's not just a matter, I'm not concerned here with the issue of privacy, although this is an important one. I'm concerned here with the idea that knowledge and the amounts of knowledge and how it's organized and how it's used and the speed and effectiveness with which it is used is really being transformed. In 2007, when this study was done, the sum of human information from pre-dynastic Egypt till now was 256 exabytes. Now, this is what we had accumulated. That was in 2007. But the amount of traffic on the Internet is now one exabyte per day. So the KSA project will produce one exabyte of data every day, that's the, the kilometer square array. So we're adding data at a much faster pace. We will more than double the global sum of knowledge in the world in one year. So the age of big data is really already here. And we have to ask ourselves, how are we handling ourselves? Because a lot more change is going to come. And the future of the internet involves a lot of things, including demands for internet governance, and Vint and I were on a committee that just met in Singapore to discuss what we should do about all of that. But anyway, beyond tomorrow, I will tell you, is an important set of discussions going on between governments and between industry and between users of the Internet. I hope we are more present in this. And just to show you that how ignorant we are in our part of the world, the heart of the Internet is something called ICANN, which is the International Corporation for on, on Assignment of Names and Numbers, which gives you your unique address. It allows us, it, it's the one who says .com, .net, .edu are acceptable endings that uh, defines AZ for South Africa, EG for Egypt, and so on. How many people here? know that the head of that institution is an American Arab. An Arab, Lebanese descent. His name is Fadish Hat. It's amazing to me how totally disengaged we are from what is happening in the world outside. And the world outside is crafting a profound knowledge revolution, a knowledge revolution, not information. Uh, what I'm going to say is it's all intertwined, but for convenience, I'm going to split it into seven pillars. And the first one of these starts with parsing life and organization, because in the past we have always produced knowledge in, in volumes, in essays, monographs. And each of these volumes, put them next to each other. That's how we build libraries. It's like building with bricks. You can make a beautiful structure with the bricks, and each brick is clear. This is no longer very visible. The old system of knowledge was dead. If Claudio and I have the same copy of a book, 
and we open page 157, the first line in his book and my book will be the same. And we can close it and go back 10 years later and we reopen them and they will still be the same. But if I tell him, look at such and such a website, and he goes in two minutes later, the website may have been updated because websites are alive, they're constantly changing, and they are becoming the fundamental unit of knowledge, no longer the old, finished, published product. So the document is changing, the structure of documents will change, we will have 3D images and video now available, and the old uh, hypertext is going to change because hypertext is a, is a, is a 92, 1992 technology. And the web 2.0 will give way to the web, uh, the semantic web. And that enables us to think differently about organization of knowledge, whether in a library or with my friend, the president of the university, uh, Sama Brahim, you have to ask, we have these departments. But this is a living map of what the social sciences look like today. This is based on how much self-referencing the size of the circle and the size of the blue arrows is the connectivity and cross-referencing between the scientific disciplines. It is no longer the rigid silos that used to exist in the past. This was done by Eigenfactor a few years ago and here's one for the natural sciences that shows how molecular and cell biology is really very much at the heart of things connected to medicine and many other parts of the disciplines. And beyond conventional keyboards, we already have augmented reality. We have many other things. We have push information. We have access to open databases everywhere in the world and so on. So instead of the old books being put next to each other, we really have a living, vibrant, changing, interconnected knowledge base across the whole planet. Like a huge brain covering the whole planet with neurons firing in all directions as the new knowledge is being formed at a speed and a pace that is accelerating beyond anything that human beings have known in the past. And one of those transformations, which you all know and you all use with your uh, mobiles, which have now been silenced and put in your pockets, thanks to Dr. Faham, we have a different story. In the past, throughout history, text was the basic communication for information and knowledge very few images. Why? Because images were difficult and expensive. But the human mind is geared to process images. And just think and imagine, you suddenly go someplace, open a door, look for a second and close the door. You can now say how big a room is there, what the color of the walls are, color of the carpets, what sort of furniture, whether there are people in it or not, whether there are windows, whether there are drapes, etc., etc., etc. In a fraction of a second, your mind has taken in all this information visually and processed it. If you try to describe it in text, it would take an enormous amount of text and communication to do. But on the other hand, on the other hand, text has a great value that is different. Because text uses a triple abstraction. The abstraction of the letter, the abstraction of the word, and the abstraction of the sentence. And the reader constructs in his mind as he or she reads what the author intended to communicate. So it's a collaborative venture. The visual one is a direct processing. But what we do know, it is much easier to look at these pine cones than to read their description and try to imagine what they really look like. And so on. There are many positives, of course. Medical research, we can do 3D uh, analyses uh, and virtual analyses in terms of uh, uh, inside the body. We can look at scales that we couldn't look at before. You can look beyond the visual spectrum. This is a heat image taken, and that heat image is used also in tomography to to identify pains for people. And there are things, of course, this being the Tokyo subway, but I could show just as well the Paris, New York, or other subway, and I would say it's almost impossible. I defy anybody to describe it in text. 
you need the image, right, to go with it. And I haven't been an astronaut, but I can enjoy what astronauts do through the pictures they send. We can see the energy use in different ways than we could before. So let's worry about that. The next thing, the third of my seven pillars, is that humans and machines are going to have to work. And a simple statement is this. With the exception of pure math and some aspects of philosophy, such as questioning the meaning of life and the purpose of the universe, in every other field of knowledge, every other field of knowledge, humans will need machines to access, retrieve, manipulate, and add to the body of knowledge. It will no longer be possible for any human being to access, retrieve, manipulate, and add to the body of knowledge without the help of machines. That's not bad, not good, it just is. And this, in a way, expands our brain's reach beyond anything our parents could imagine because I can look up materials that have been written all over the world, whether or not they're available here, because of the internet, because of digitization, but it's different. And that change, too, is happening with incredible speed. In the meantime, others are working on artificial intelligence, and I will show you something close to it, which was done by our young people here in the library with collaboration with professors from the University of Alexandria in a moment right now. But remember, already in 97, Deep Blue, the computer, defeated Gary Kasparov in chess, but chess is a very limited game. Imagination is a much harder, and much bigger game to think of. Today, the human brain is still a million times more powerful than the most powerful computer. But the way computers are going, it will not be very long in time, that we will have computers that are one million times more powerful than the human brain, and the question then becomes, what sort of relationship will we have with our machines then? The next item is complexity and chaos, and we know that there is an emerging science of complexity and chaos because we live in very complex situations that are chaotic in the scientific sense, meaning that it's very difficult to predict at a certain level where the values would be. Fifth is that computation and research are going to become a part of the research paradigm, not just to support the researchers, but an integrated part just as mathematics and, and statistics on one side and computational uh, uh, philosophy on the other. Why? Because we have moved from the idea of science as organizing material into data collections into the idea of connections between data collections. And that requires a lot of concept, conceptual mathematical management, but also, also, from the computer sciences where information theory and database management have been fundamental tools. And data complexity itself differs at different sources, different levels, and different levels of reliability and uncertainty, which in our complex life systems becomes very important. Now what will this lead to in new computer architecture, pathways, clusters, network controls, neural nets, manifolds, virtual communities, all sorts of things, but I don't know where it's going, but I know that it is not standing still, and that's for sure it's moving very fast. My sixth of the seven pillars is convergence and transformation. I mentioned already the convergence of bio-info nanotechnologies, but transformative research is also arising. For example, the idea of the discovery of the structure of the DNA, along with the availability of high-speed computers, gave us what Dr. Magdi and I used to call the omics, right? All the, we have genomics, functional genomics, structural genomics, proteomics, metabolomics. All of these fields did not exist as fields of science a few years ago, well, a few decades ago. So that discovery is a transformative discovery. Will, for example, right now in the new biology, the efforts of some to move towards synthetic biology generate an equally transformative research, I don't know. Finally, the seventh pillar of knowledge revolution is pluridisciplinarity. Because our worlds are complex, because we want to talk about environment, about gender, about poverty, about food security, and these are complex issues, we need multidisciplinary. We need the, not just the, the information that the sciences produce, 
but we also need the insights of the social sciences and the wisdom of the humanities. So these are the seven pillars of the science revolution. It's a profound revolution. And now, can we become producers of knowledge rather than consumers of technology? My answer is yes. And right here in the Library of Alexandria, young people just like you have just recorded an achievement that I will summarize by saying that Google was unable to do it and we did it. And it has a lot of promise for the future. So I refer to that, my concluding part, as an inspiring example. It's in computational linguistics, but it's a very inspiring example. We have a center here which we created last year, but the, center, the staff had been working for a while on Arab computational linguistics. This is the team. These are the linguists, and these are the IT experts. And they work together across disciplines to do what we're going to see right now. Now I have to back up a little bit and start out by saying this initially started with the question of can we design an automatic translation device so that you put a, a query in Arabic, it goes to somebody in the United States who in English, that person would answer in English and you receive the answer in Arabic. That was the original problem and that was a problem that we tried to work with with the United Nations. The United Nations had designed a program around something called the Universal Networking Language, which was born by the design of some Japanese experts, along with the UN University in Tokyo. And the idea was this, that if you wanted to design computer translation, the conventional way was to do a special program between paired languages, Arabic, English, English, Arabic. Then if you wanted to do French Arabic, Arabic French, you needed a new program. So the idea was, well, instead of doing all of this, let's remove these and put a universal networking language, which is a machine language, a logical template, and then go from Arabic to UNL and UNL to English and back from English to Arabic. Now this may seem like Widnak Meninia Goha, right? But actually, think about it for a moment. Let's put the French in. Now you will see that not only we can do Arabic French, but also French English and you add German, and now you have Arabic German, and you have Arabic Spanish, and so on. And actually, we have 48 language groups working. And the reason the UN was interested is that small languages like, say, Armenian, you would never find people to design a program for Armenian, Arabic, Arabic, Armenian. But Armenian linguists can do Armenian, UNL, UNL, Armenian, and Arabic specialists, in this case ourselves, can do Arabic, UNL, UNL, Arabic, and then everybody collaborates in the end and gets something out of it. So this was the idea. It's becoming partially a reality. These have been translated that way. But we focus on this part, and we use it also for other things which you will see in a moment. Just to show you, this is what a sentence in UNL looks like. It's not a readable language, it's a logical computer language. This is the Taqula Alimat Lugawiyat Fidarasa Haditha Agratha Nadar Min Lugat al Alam Safa and Dathar bin Hat al Karnal Hadiwal Ashreen. This sentence is written up in computer UNL this way. So how does it work? The question is can we create a common language? So if I look at something simple, Akal al Walad Tufaha, and I get it into different languages, the positions of the words change in the sentences. But I can construct a universal construct, a semantic graph that will say this is the sentence. Now the question is, can I convert the sentence back into a correct Arabic sentence? And the answer is yes. I have to have a dictionary for universal words that will take these words and convert them back. But then, ah, there's a catch. I need also to reorder them in a different way. So I need computer designs for Arabic grammar that will give me a proper sentence. Obviously, this is just a three-word sentence, so this is not very complicated. But it becomes more important, just shows you how much we need to do this. And so we decided to go the hard way. 
to build a corpus, to build programs for language, for this, the uh, grammars, for uh, uh, specification, for dactylization, and so on. And so if this is the, the semantic graph for that three-word sentence, most of the sentences we have, and you will see many of these diagrams, look like much more complicated than the three-word sentence. So what are we doing? We are creating, and we have now almost reached what we want to reach, almost the International Corpus of Arabic. Arabic is only 1.2% of the material available on the internet. English is 55%, and that's why I insist that people in the library must learn English, because in addition to Arabic, otherwise their space to get information from the internet is down to 1.2% of what's available. But if they also master English, then they can do that, and if they master French, they can get better as well. We know the other efforts underway, the Mehrab project in Tunisia, the King Abdullah content initiative, the King Abdul Aziz uh, uh, project in Saudi Arabia. We looked at all these efforts, and we are different. It doesn't duplicate any of them. So we're building this corpus. And the benchmark was the best English language ones, and here's our design. 100 million words that represent modern standard Arabic as it is used by radio announcers uh, in the press and so on in all countries. And it's very important as it is used today. It's not Sibawiya, it's not uh, the, the poetry of, uh, of Ibru Qais, uh, it is today. And cover all varieties of Arabic as used everywhere in the Arab world. So it has to be morphologically, syntactically, and semantically analyzed. Where do we get our sources? This is where we get all our sources from the press, the articles, the academic, and there are sub-sources and so on. And we organize the genres in the information, religion, literature, prose, uh, uh, humanities, natural sciences, applied sciences, etc., etc., etc. So we have sources from the press, about 30% articles from the web, 20% books, 43% and academic research papers, 8%. This is the, the percentage distribution by source. This is by genre, sports, literature, biography, arts, religion, etc., etc. And this is by countries, all the countries. Actually, all the countries except Comoros, because Comoros doesn't have enough production for us to do work on there. But Egypt represents 13%. Why do we do this? Because Words are slightly different. In Egypt, we say muzaharat tullabiya. In the Levant, they would say tadahurat talibiya. It's not wrong, it's just different. And the corpus has to recognize both types. So we've already collected the 120 million words. We have entered 80 million because we have to enter them while respecting these different percentage distributions. And now, once they're entered, they really are uh, analyzed. It means that we look at roots, we move to the lemmas. So if you take darasa, you have darasa, tadris, mudarasa, mad mudarris, madrasa, madrus, daris, daris, darasa, tadaras, and then the suffix and stems on one side, the nouns and variants of all of that. So what is the current state of analysis? We have collected them each word has 16 pieces of lexical information. These are the 16 pieces. So basically, you have a table that has 100 million lines and 16 columns, which has been filled in the manner in which you see from these sources respecting the distribution by country and by subject that we have. And this is the analysis that is there. And each one of these has meta information so we can retrieve that individual word out of the 100 million words. And then it's an analyzed corpus that helps researchers to find authentic information. We can look at verbs. We can put verbs uh, in present tense within context, etc. Next thing we did was to take two million of these words and go through them by hand with the experts, two million words with experts, to find the exact correct spelling for each one and its interpretation. So 
that may sound like it's a huge thing, but it's very important. It is a huge thing. Because in Arabic, you have enormous difficulty because most of our text is lacking vocalization or diacriticals. So, Ain Lam Mim could be Alam, could be Ilm, could be Alima, could be Alama, could be a lot of things. And on top of that, uh, in English we would say John loves Mary and Mary loves John are not the same. The position of the word defines the, the, the actor and the, and, the, and the acted upon, but in Arabic, al-fa'il or maf'ul bihi is through the dhamma, the u, and the fatha that you would recognize wherever their location is in the sense. So, if we want to do this correctly, we have to define each word. That's why we did two million words. So how did we do this? Why would we have errors? Well, here's an example, three examples. Automatic analysis. Bada al-mu'tamar bayna al-sa'a al-khamisa wa al-sadisa. Bayna is what? The programs would say harf agar, ism, fa'al madi, etc. And it chooses the word harf agar. We say this is wrong by hand. We say to the computer, this is wrong. And we do a manual verification and we say it is a dharf zaman. And then that goes to train the computer in the training data. Next time, understand this. And it's also stored in our lexicon. Here's another example, which is very clear here. فَهُمْ عَاجِزُونَ عَنْ سِيَاغَةْ مَوْقِفِهُمْ كِنْهُمْ مِنْ Okay, analyze that. Chose فَعْلَ مَادِي فَهْمَ فَهِمَ Which is wrong. So in that case, we do a manual verification. We say no. It is a fa and the hum, which is a damir, and we store that in the training data of the computers. Two million words we did this way, so that we know exactly the right things, and we know where the computer went wrong. And we keep training the computer to improve its work. A form of artificial intelligence, which is called contextual interpretation. In this case, ig'al min al-irada silah la biyakhar al-mustahil, very appropriate for this project. We did it, and it's fa'la amr. It was unable to find one, and we both stored in training data and lexicon. Now we can really improve our programs. Why? We have two million words, and we know exactly where the errors are. And then we design a program, and we run it through automatically, and we see, and we can measure, because we know 100% what constitutes 100%, we can measure the precisions of our programs as it is. In, in November, we were at 87%. We are now at 91% because I'm hoping to reach between 95 and 98% accuracy. This is remarkable. And what I'm going to show you here has not been done by anybody. So what are the values of this? Why is that important? Well, the first of these is disambiguation. If you see a sentence like, كتب نجيب محفوظ العديد من الروايات الرائعة. What is Nagib? Well, it could be sifa, noble, excellent. It could uh, be a noun, and it could also be nugib, we reply, because there is no tashkil, there is no vocalization. So the analyzer is now able to disambiguate and say no. In this context, in this context, it means it's a noun. You can take complex words, and Arabic is very complex, and you do a morphological and syntactic and, 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 uh, analysis, and you get these kinds of analysis. If you take an example like the word adrakuna, and you split it into its component parts, and you analyze each part of it, it could be adrakuna or adrikuna, but how will the computer know what? So the computer analyzes all the possibilities. There are actually 68 possible combinations that could go in there. There are only two that are correct, Adrakuna and Adrikuna. And based on that and on this ambiguation, we can say A is past tense prefix, Daraka, catch, wow, they, na, us. That we can now say. And now here comes the big part, which is where Google and us were struggling. Diacritization is at tashkil, at tashkil fil al arabi. The question is, can you take a text that is, with, has no tashkil, put it into the program, and get the tashkil on the other side? Now, that requires not only to be able to understand each words, 
but also requires that you can do Arab for the sentence. So here we go. Two approaches, a statistical approach, mathematical formulation, which Google followed and others followed, and the rules-based approach, which we did. And they went ahead of us, but like the story of the tortoise and the hare, we crossed the line first. This is the Google site, and it says the Google Diacratize APL is no longer available. Thank you for your interest. Because I spent two hours with the Vice President of Google, they reached 70% accuracy and were not able to reduce the error terms beyond that. We are now at less than 10% errors. We are 91% and going. So we made our contributions, we use our analyzer, and we arrive at the best choice for the word. And that enables us to take a text like this, which you will, is, it has no tashkil. Actually, it has, uh, in, in, con, in the correct Arabic, it has errors of spelling. The absence of a hamza is considered a spelling error. So the, the red words are spelling errors. Uh, because the, the Aleph with or without the Hamza is different from the Aleph of Baghdad or Infigar. They are not the same. So the Hamza, the absence of the Hamza is considered a spelling mistake. The blue is the absence of Tashkil. And in we go and out it comes. A'lana al gayshu al amerikiyu maqtala salasatin min gunudihi amsi fi Baghdad fi infijari sayyaratin mufakhakhatin. What you are seeing here, nobody else in the world has been able to achieve except those young Egyptians sitting here. And that is not all. And that is not all. Now, what you see here, of course, this particular text is 100% correct. But at 90% accuracy, it means that other texts may have 30 or 35% error. And if you do a lot of text, you will get less than 10% error. So you get 90% accurate. But that requires a lot of text. But it means that there's a distribution around that. This one is 100% correct. Others will have 30% error on average. When you do a lot, we are at about 10%. And that is why I want to move to 95 to 98% before we release it to the public. At present, this website is open to specialist linguists around the world who are doing a, a peer review. They're looking at the quality of our analytical work. As you will notice here, it took seven years to do, from 2006 to 2013. But we can do a lot more. Now, having done all of this on that side and being able to reach that level of accuracy and precision, we can now go back to the idea of the UNL, which you saw initially for translation, but because our part of the logical structure of the language has become so strong, we can now move to another step and use the UNL, Arabic UNL, UNL back to Arabic to do a lot of things, including to improve your writing. So you can start with a rephrasing system. If you take the text and pass it through the UNL, you do a rephrasing algorithm. It's very important to understand this. Through the meaning, semantic graph, like the semantic graphs I showed you, then the computer reinterprets the semantic graph into Arabic. So you get a new Arabic sentence, and then you can compare these two. And actually, because we have been very rigorous in the rules we put in, the quality of the language improves dramatically. Okay, here's an example from one of our publications, an old catalog, and this says George Bahguri, first sentence here, says Mawalid al Bahgura lo Masr, with three dashes. It goes, comes back, Wulida fi Bahgura bilo Masr fi am al Much better, awal gumla fi'aliya, as opposed to a gumla ismaya, passive form of the verb. More important, if you look at the original, nowhere does it say 1932 is kilograms or miles or years or what. But here it says, fi am al How did we get that? That is what I said, a form of artificial intelligence which we call a contextual analyzer. It analyzes out of the context since we're talking about birth and we're talking about someone and the four 
digit figure next to it is probably a birth date. And uh, so next you will look at this. These three dashes have become phi, b, and b. It's not one dash equals something. And uh, if you take these and do another sentence like that, also becomes phalea, but more importantly, the little dash has now become a wow. So it interprets from the meaning, because it, it, this sentence disappears. What comes in is those little circles with the arrows and so on, and the logical language behind, and then that gets reconverted into Arabic. So you can go on. In this case, the little dash becomes min. He got the Magister for Tarikh al-Fan, Gamad Birmingham, min Gamad Birmingham. Here, for example, they are phi. And here, the dash stays a dash because it's one dash, two dash, three dash, it's just a number. So the computer can tell the difference between all of these. Now you take a fragmented text like that. That was also a fragmented text, which you see here. You can convert it into Arabic, and it becomes a whole sentence. And all of these red things are additions and reinterpretations. And you will notice that here, the computer has done what? It added the one nines which were missing here. It recognized that these needed to be there between 1989 to 94. It added the one nine figures there, plus phi, wow, and so on and so forth. Now you have a paragraph that is explicit, simplified, and cohesive. Then what about the way a lot of you young people send SMSs with the repeated letters that say things like that? <laughs> okay, we actually are able, because we go through that, we've done special subroutines in the program, and we get it correct. Naish, fikhir, salam, as you see it here. A computer can actually correct that. How about moving from colloquial Egyptian to modern standard Arabic? Actually, we took this from Wikipedia. Here is a sentence. And Eli, Kaman, Fi, Kitira, typical Egyptian colloquialisms. Here they become Alavi, Aidan, Wahunaka, Kathira, etc. Corrected. We can do better than that. We can do summarization. So if you were to take an Arabic text and you convert it into a graph, and then you summarize it and you contract it, you have a different graph, and then you reconvert it, what would you get? Would it work? Would the computer know what is the essential part of the sentence to keep and what to throw away? The answer is yes, we can. And here is a complex sentence that involves in uh, Zai Hawass is announcing new discoveries in this hall uh, in a conference organized by the World Bank and opened by, by me at 6 o'clock. And so we convert it into a graph, the semantic graph you saw. The computer then has to decide what's the important part what are the essential links, and then the rest to keep around it, and remove the others, and then we reconvert it, and here's what it looks like. And it's a much shorter sentence. You are in Dr. Zai Hawas Tafasil Tishafat al Asariya al Hadida, Khilal al Fitah Mu'tamar al Dawli, Le Tanmiya wal Hifaz al Manatif al Turasiya. Here's the long sentence that was there before, and as several of my colleagues pointed out, it removed my name because it was not very relevant to the importance of the sentence. Okay, well, can we further summarize this till we get only a headline? And would the headline make sense? And the answer is yes. So the idea is simple, the same diagram you saw, but I will take this summarized text and put it back here again. And we were able to do this three times, and here we took a text about discovery of crocodiles in south of Aswan, and we summarized it, and then we uh, summarized the summarization, and then we actually produced a single headline, short headline. And they are correct. So the summarized text says, أعلنت إدارة المحميات الطبيعية بأسوان تمكنها من تحديد موقع أحد تماسيح العملاقة وقررت صيده خلال شهر مايو وقرر المهند محمود حسيب أن التمساح العملاقة يصل طول النحو ثلاث أمطار ويصعب صيده لوجوده في إحدى البرك المائية المنخافضة. This was the statement summarized already from the two or three paragraph uh, newspaper article. That's this summarization. We do what we did with my name, removing my name, 
And there you have a summary statement and it says أعلنت إدارة المحميات الطبيعية بأسوان تمكنها من تحديد موقع أحد التماسيح العملاقة ويصل طوله نحو ثلاث أمتار. Correct sentence selecting various things. But if you take that simplified text, summary of summary, and now we remove more, you have the headline, which is تحديد موقع أحد التماسيح العملاقة. So you can see that it is in fact by understanding, not by individual words that we're working. The last item is multi-document summarization. We had a conference here, like we do here, and it appeared in Ahram al-Wafd al-Dustur and the Liyum al-Sabah. We took the texts that appeared, and we said to our computer, okay, start interpreting them and summarizing them collectively. So this first paragraph corresponds to these two sentences in terms of meaning, to this paragraph, this paragraph and the half, from that one, and so we'll take all of these and create one semantic representation for it and put it aside, and then we'll do the same again, and we do that again, and we have another one, and we put it aside again, and then we do this third one, and then, oops, this one appears only in that one article, not in the others, so, okay, it's flagged that way, and then we have its own semantic representation. So now I have these three semantic representations. I'm going to do summarization for each of them, like we did for the other. And we come out with a smaller one and a smaller sentence, a smaller one and a smaller sentence, a smaller one and a smaller sentence. I combine these three sentences, and I now have, this is the summary of everything that appeared in all these newspapers. And it's a correct logical summary. So my friends, uh, we're doing a lot of that. Now we're still working on this one, the idea to be able to put the re a search in one language and find the results in other languages. You get a search, you get some results in Arabic, but we also want to be able to get them in English and French and so on. That's the part we're working on right now. So we've done much and I think more is being done and there have been some really major breakthroughs. And with a little more effort, when the quality reaches 95 to 98%, we'll be able to release it to the public for free. Now, this was all done with 100% local effort right here. I showed you the pictures of the team that did this work. It took them a long time. We, we uh, gave them support in the library. They'll do it. But it comes back to the question, why are we absent from the production of knowledge? We can do it. We can do it. We are doing it. Your colleagues are doing it right here in the library. I gave you, I think, an inspiring example. And when we become producers of knowledge and not just consumers of technology, then and only then will we be able to build capacity for science and technology in our world, in the whole world, and science will be able to feed the hungry and heal the sick and protect the environment and give dignity to work and create a space for self-expression and working all together there's so much we can do for the next generation and for the whole world. Thank you.